Welcome back after the break. Just before we went for uh, a break, we uh, read through chapter two of First Timothy and just shared our insights. And we, uh, we had Christopher, you know, ask a question. He says that, uh, you know, if uh, the church or Christians are being persecuted, uh, should we stay silent, just endure the persecution? What should we do? Uh, no, we shouldn't be silent and just endure uh, the persecution, but we can use the law of the land that uh, is in our favor, you know, and uh, we can uh, speak, uh, but do it peacefully in the right way. Uh, you know, uh, we can also f fight our case uh, in the court like we are doing here in Bangalore City with the, with the anti-conversion bill. Uh, and has been done in various other cities as well. So if, you know, pastors have been taken um, uh, illegally, uh, you know, uh, not following the procedure, they've just been uh, arrested, then uh, there are certain groups that uh, have come up, Christian groups that basically uh, have a, a, a knowledge or educated uh, uh, regarding the law of the land, what uh, we are entitled to as Christians, as believers. Uh, and then, you know, they use that to help, uh, uh, you know, uh, release people from prison, from jail. So, uh, yes, there are various organizations uh, and churches support them, uh, meet up, they discuss things, how they can go about it, how they can help pastors and, uh, uh, you know, various other uh, churches who are being persecuted, uh, just stand by them and, uh, you know, what they can do and things like that. Also educate the pastors and leaders on the law of the land, what they should do, what they shouldn't be doing, what this, uh, the, the, the new bills that are being passed, what it entails, uh, or, you know, how they need to be careful uh, and all of those things. So just educate the people as well. Yes, we need to take the necessary precautions, uh, be wise uh, uh, as serpents, innocent as doves and do what we're supposed to do and, you know, uh, do our best and just pray uh, for the leadership so that we can live peaceful lives uh, and also continue doing our ministry and uh, doing what God has uh, called us to do. Regarding uh, his question on, on Israel, uh, yes, whatever is happening, you know, uh, Israel is going to be the center stage of world history. Uh, you know, it's going to happen soon. It's happening. And also uh, the prophecies, the Old Testament prophecies, the end time prophecies are coming true. So it's all basically pointing out to uh, uh, how scripture is authoritative, is inherent, uh, you know, is uh, uh, infallible, is the truth and how uh, uh, what is mentioned in scripture is, uh, you know, is happening in history and how our God is uh, a God of history is concerned with what is happening now and also the end time events. So it just helps us to know uh, uh, and also the quickening of time, the end time events, uh, what we as a church need to do uh, in these end time events, just prepare ourselves and how we need to spread the gospel throughout uh, 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 the whole world, the nations, the people of this world. Does that help, Christopher? That's very brief and short. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I, I Just on Israel, I mean, I'm, I, I, I mean just, just a comment over there is that, um, you know, I would think that there's an expectation that, uh, you know, as as they are as Israel defends its position, um, but eventually they will they will also be able to, uh, you know, uh, take back uh, you know certain things that uh, that will be uh, that they they have wanted for for a long time, like for example the Temple Mount. Uh, so um, there's I I would think there was an expectation that. That peaceful means uh, may not be the may not be the way going forward. Um, it'll be. It'll, I mean, there will be a lot of there will be wars that will actually take place, and uh, you know the situation there is is not peaceful at all right now, or it hasn't been peaceful for a for, for a long time, and uh, you know that is. I think that is sort of uh, you know in some ways contrary to what you know what uh, this this uh, 
you know, Bible uh, uh, scripture talks about, where uh, there is, there is, you know, in Israel there is an expectation that you know there there has to be a show of strength, and that show of strength is is shown through you know the way they can defend their position and, and as well as you know be offensive when 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 required. Thank you, Christopher. I would use the word contrary to what scripture says, but you know, we need to, uh, there are different scripture passages that talk about various instances, various situations. So we need to interpret those scripture passages in that context, in the light of what is mentioned in that specific context. Yes, scripture also speaks about there is going to be wars. Uh, the end time battles, wars against nations, one world rule, and all of those things, uh, you know, terrible things that are going to happen. So yes, it talks about a lot of war, bloodshed, uh, uh, persecutions, difficulties, uh, and all of those things. It's not going to be peaceful, uh, but you know, so these are two different contexts. What I mentioned first about our city, uh, what people are doing in our city, in in the context uh, in, in India as well. But yes, in 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 um, Israel, the context is very different. It just it also scripture prophecies talk about war and how there's going to be terrible warfare and killing and murder and all of those things which is happening in Israel. So we need to look at prophecies in the light of the prophecies in the fulfillment of their prophecies and also see uh, you know uh, other scripture passages we're talking about submission to leadership authority in the light of uh, in the in the context of what it is written. In, and in the context of where we are living in, in which geographical area and what kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 scripture that we want to interpret in our context, we need to be very careful and mindful, yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Christopher. Uh, if we'll move on, uh, we look at uh, study First Timothy chapter 2. Um, verse 1 says, therefore, uh, Paul writes, therefore, uh, I exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, when we are reading uh, the uh, the letters that Paul is writing, whether it's uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, or, you know, or Romans, we need to uh, remember that it's a letter, there is continuity. Uh, we have, for our own convenience, have put chapter and verse. Uh, but it's a continued uh, a letter, so there is continuity. So you now always look at uh, you know when you're studying uh, these scriptures, you know, and you're studying these epistles, uh, look at in the context that uh, the the previous verse. Okay, you, we left off at First Timothy uh, chapter one, verse um, verse nineteen, I think that is or twenty. Okay, so 19 and 20, we need to look at how Paul is continuing to write from in that context. So Paul is continuing basically uh, what he mentioned about Hymenius and Alexander going away from their faith, shipwrecking their faith. So Paul is saying in the light of, um, you know, that people are going away from the faith, the first thing he wants the church to do is uh, for them to pray. Okay, uh, because people are not maintaining a good conscience, uh, and because they're not maintaining a, a good conscience, so he's indicating the importance of prayer. And then he's saying, you know, so in that way, he's saying, first of all, uh, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So basically, uh, supplications, prayers, intercessions all have to do with praying um, and they are essentially different parts of our prayer uh, but we don't have to be too fixed or rigid on this their differentiation uh, but just for uh, you know for our understanding for our purpose of our understanding supplication basically means um, you know prayer request or petition uh, which is basically you know you're begging or you're pleading uh, before God. So you're like a beggar, you know, just begging and pleading God uh, with your prayer request or petition. And it's it's begging or pleading God uh, for mercy and protection. That is supplication. Prayer is also, you know, uh, you know, praying, requesting, making your petition known, but it's doing it for the needs, wants, and things that uh, uh, you know, you lack, or people uh, uh, who are close to, or you're praying for, uh, lack. 
intercession is uh, to pray for someone else uh, on their behalf primarily uh, it's basically for salvation you're interceding on behalf of them for their salvation so that they can be saved uh, accept jesus as their lord and savior and the last thing uh, in prayer he's saying is giving thanks uh, which is giving thanks for uh, all of them okay and he's saying here that you know um uh giving thanks to be made for all men so you need to you know uh uh bring forth the supplication prayers intercession giving of thanks uh for all men which means it does not mean that we don't pray for women and children uh the word men here in the greek is anthropos uh, which is a gender neutral which means uh, people uh, so it's inclusive of men, women, and children, uh, like you read in other versions. Uh, so we just don't say that we need to pray only for uh, the Bible asks us to pray only for men, because uh, and quote First Timothy chapter uh, two verse one. But here, men, the Greek word is anthropos, which is a gender neutral, and it's inclusive of everyone. It it means people. Uh, Christopher, just a request, please, if you can uh, mute your mic. Thank you. Um, and so Paul is saying, uh, you know, uh, you know, pray for people. And he's saying one way you can practice this is pray for people everywhere, uh, whenever you uh, you can, uh, you know, and wherever you can. So whether you're, uh, you know, driving uh, in the, in your car or driving, uh, riding your bike or walking on the street or you know, going to the market or in the mall shopping or in the grocery or the uh, vegetable market, you're shopping, you just see something or you hear an ambulance whiz past, you know, you just pray, uh, you pray for the salvation of the person, pray for healing, uh, you know, see something on the street, uh, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, the condition of the, uh, infrastructure of your city is not good you're just praying uh, you're driving to work or uh, you know you're going to school college i mean so, sorry you're going to work your workplace uh, wherever you know just uh, uh, send out those prayers to god just let prayer arise in your heart for people uh, for the government for the in infrastructure for situations that you see uh, in your city just uh, intercede and pray for uh, people so he's saying you know uh, let your supplications prayers intercession and giving of thanks be made for all uh, men and then he specifically says for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence so he's basically saying you know he's specifying kings and all those in authority because christians um had such a um, aversion to kings and those in authority because of the scenario they were living in the persecution that they were uh, going through uh, basically here uh, you know uh, uh, in ephesus and the roman uh, uh, the whole thing was a roman world you know uh, nero who was a caesar the ruler at that time the emperor of rome uh, you know uh, he was a very evil man a very wicked man he came to position by killing two people and, uh, you know, history tells us that uh, he destroyed, burned down 70% uh, of Rome because he wanted to extend his uh, palace. He wanted to make his palace bigger. And it was not well accepted by the people. So he turned it all, uh, you know, the blame on the Christians. And hence, uh, Christians were severely uh, persecuted um, uh, 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 throughout the Roman Empire, throughout, throughout the Roman world. And, uh, you know, Nero was also uh, known for uh, his uh, amusing people, Christians, basically, uh, you know, making a sport of them and entertainment out of them, uh, you know, by having these uh, Arena, arenas where you know they he would just uh, have these christians out there in the in the open ground or the field uh, and send wild animals or these uh, hu really huge trained well trained soldiers with their uh, you know like gladiators you know uh, just coming to fight these uh, poor christians and you know these christians would you know run to save their lives and it would just be like a sport and people would sit and watch like you know they would watch olympics or any other sport where they're entertained where they're enjoying it and out of all of this 
eventually you know came out uh, you know uh, uh, somebody uh, spoke against it and then it uh, said instead of doing this why not have sports so the whole concept of olympics came about you know uh, uh, after seeing how christians were being persecuted thrown to animals uh, he also burned christians as torches uh, and uh, you know he was uh, known for his life of extravagance and indulgence so a very wicked ruler and um, uh, in those days kings uh, you know would act like gods and so people would worship them as gods and christians were known uh, to live uh, uh, peaceful lives and also were known to follow the law of the land to do good uh, works uh, but would, were also known as people who would not consider king as lord because they had a god above who they would consider him as god as lord as not and, and not as a king as lord and they would pray to god and not uh, pray to uh, the king so uh, this was held against them and they were very very angry with um, the christians um, and also we see that you know nero uh, 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 you know uh, 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 was instrumental uh, in releasing of uh, when paul was imprisoned for the first time the first time he was imprisoned uh, in caesarea philippi and then he appealed to caesar um, and then he was sent to rome um, where he was under house arrest for two years and then uh, you know nero finally heard his case and uh, you know he was set free but then during his second imprisonment he see that uh, was condemned by nero and uh, nero had paul beheaded and uh, peter crucified so uh, extremely wicked man and uh, christians were you know uh, uh, would never have that heart to just pray for uh, those in authority those uh, in leadership uh, because of the torment, the difficulties, the persecutions they went through. But Paul is reminding them that you need to pray uh, for all those in authority, um, especially for those in um, leadership position. And why should you do that? So that, you know, he gives them two reasons. Uh, he says, you know, uh, do your supplications, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks for people in leadership, in authority, so that... You know, we as Christians, we as believers of Jesus Christ can live quiet and peaceful lives and live in godliness and reverence uh, towards God. So he's saying, you know, um, uh, uh, do this, pray for them so that we will be able to, you know, uh, he's bringing about the whole aspect of prayer for authority uh, in terms of, an. Uh, he's reminding them of an evangelical purpose. He's saying our real goal is so that, you know, um, uh, you know, they would come under the authority of Jesus. They would know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They would make their decisions, uh, you know, uh, uh, favoring uh, 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 you know, uh, the Christians allowing the gospel to be uh, uh, propagated, to be preached, to be taught to all people, and so that we can worship God uh, uh, in our own churches, in our home churches, uh, in a peaceful way, and uh, we are able to live in all godliness and reverence towards uh, God. And then he goes on in verses 3 and 4, he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the uh, truth. Yes, say Colossum, thank you. Um, so it's he says it's good and pleasing in God's sight that we pray for all people, especially for those in uh, in leadership, civil authority, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives, live in godliness and reverence to God. And he's saying this prayer is going to lead into fulfilling God's desire. So what is God's desire? God's desire is that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of God the truth so here in verse 4 uh, we see the desire of god's heart that paul is uh, mentioning he's saying it's god's desire for everyone to be saved and uh, to come to the knowledge of the truth or to know the truth but uh, having said this we need to understand uh, that when we say that god desires all men to be saved it does not mean that you know all of them would be automatically saved 
uh, if we say that everyone will be automatically saved, it implies that God would not have any element of human response in the gospel. But when we're saying that God desires for all men to be saved, uh, we say that, you know, there is a condition uh, by you know the a uh, condition of God's desire or what is His desire of His heart uh, uh, is that you know uh, the condition is that uh, there is a genuine response from the person. Okay, there is a genuine response from human beings. Yes, it's God's desire that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, but it is conditioned. This desire of God is conditioned by a genuine response of human beings. Um, you know, he, God won't fulfill his desire to save all uh, men at the expense of making uh, us as robots uh, who you know who just worship him automatically. We're just programmed uh, to do so. We are not just puppets in his uh, uh, on that string just held in God's hand. But you know, he uh, gives give, given us a gift of volition. That means we, you know, we make the choice. Yes, it is his desire that all men be saved. But there is a condition that you know there should be a, a response, a genuine response from the person, from human beings that you know they yes, I, I want to be saved, I'm a sinner and I need God's salvation, I need His uh, and His uh, grace. So all men to be saved, uh, you know, uh, is a desire of God, but has a condition where this looks for a genuine response from human beings, which means that we don't just say, okay, you know, God wants its desire for all men to be saved, so everybody will be saved and I don't have to preach and teach the gospel or share my testimony or share God's goodness or what he's done. Yes, it makes us all the more go out and share and preach and teach the word of God because, you know, there is a condition, there is uh, the need is there is to be a genuine response from the person back from the person that he is a sinner that he needs God's grace he needs God's um, salvation because God is not just programmed us as rob robots or puppets on a string that you know do things automatically but we uh, have been given the free will to choose uh, and we choose um, and our choices destined where we go. So he says that, you know, all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, which means that salvation is clearly associated with coming to the knowledge of the truth. So a person cannot be saved apart from, or at least understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done to save us. And that is why, you know, we need to share the gospel of who Jesus is, why he came down to the earth, what he did, what did he do for us, how man fell into sin, how Jesus uh, saved us, and how he reconciled us back to God. So only can people be saved, only can they respond in a favorable way when they come to the knowledge of the truth and we need to give them the, the entire truth of the gospel of, uh, of sin and, uh, and how Jesus came. Uh, uh, and how he, what he did to save us and, uh, you know, purchase our uh, salvation. So all that we do, you know, our praying, our working, uh, you know, uh, our ministry, everything that we do, the sharing of the gospel, uh, uh, apologetics or evangelism, whatever, you know, it is directed towards fulfilling, fulfilling this desire of God uh, you know, that it is his good will that all men be saved and we do it under his guidance, uh, knowing that it is his, uh, it, it will be pleasing uh, towards God. Okay. Any questions so far? Verses uh, 1 to 5? Yes, Divya. We can't hear you, Divya. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. So uh, in John chapter 6, I, I'll just uh, put the verses here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jesus is talking, I believe, to his disciples uh, mm -hmm. uh, when he says, Father, for I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is verse 38 to 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, 
that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise him up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Uh, afterwards, from verse 43 to 45, um, it says uh, here again, he continues, stop grumbling among yourselves. Jesus answered, no one can come to me unless the father who sends me draw uh, draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the father and learned from him comes to me. So uh, in this, uh, in these verses, uh, it always um, gives me, uh, I get confused with, um, is it about uh, like God has already, you know, a set of a group of people whom he has chosen. And uh, so there is uh, like uh, only those whom he has chosen. Uh, mm -hmm will come to know him is it something like that or does it mean something more something else because uh, if if i have if i if i think that way then there is uh, no hope right if i'm just going to a person and uh, sharing the gospel but in one part of my heart this is there right okay mm -hmm. oh i don't know whether this this person god has drawn uh, to himself, so uh, it kind of uh, gives me a makes me a bit confused. Uh, what exactly Jesus means when he says that? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. The desire is, of course, we see here when the desire is for all men to be saved, and I believe in First Peter or Second Peter. Uh, also, it says that god is long suffering he's enduring and he wants the gospel to be uh to reach every person to the ends of the earth uh, to every person so mm -hmm. yeah so that is uh, one one question that i have uh pastor so this uh is, i think it may demand a lot of time and uh you know <laughs> but yeah yeah it, yeah Good question. Thank you, Divya. Uh, I think if you had attended the Romans uh, class in the last semester, then uh, this uh, question, uh, you know, you would ha won't have this question and this question will be answered. Uh, you know, uh, basically, we need to interpret scripture always in the light of other scripture. Uh, so we also know that uh, our God is not a partial God. He does not show favoritism, does not show uh, partiality um you know so that is god's nature and also we see here that you know in uh, first timothy chapter 2 verse 4 that it's god's uh, desire god's will that all men be saved so the all is inclusive of everybody so you know we interpret the rest of other scripture in the light of what we have from the other scripture passages so when when what we read in uh, john chapter 6 you know that uh, uh, where it says, you know, no one can come to me, John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can uh, come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up. So uh, the whole thing about predestination, which is a big theological argument where some people say, you know, some people are predestined uh, beforehand, uh, you know, uh, uh, and be chosen by God. Uh, you know, uh, uh, to receive the gospel, and some are, are, are some are destined to go to heaven, some are destined to go to hell, and so they quote scripture passages, uh, you know, pertaining to that. But you know, predestination does not mean that in the light of the whole of scripture, the entirety of scripture. When we see, you know, it's not that God chooses some for. Um, uh, for damnation, some for uh, eternal death, and for some for eternal life. We studied this in Romans chapter 9, uh, where he says, you know, when we looked at uh, Esau, I have loved, Jacob, I have, uh, 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 sorry, Jacob, I have loved, Esau, I have hated. You know, uh, we also see uh, about Pharaoh, how God uses Pharaoh. But uh, if we look at scripture, it's basically, you know, 
you know, it's not that God chooses some for some noble purposes and some, you know, to be destined for uh, uh, hell, some for heaven, for sal for salvation, some for wickedness. But um, uh, the whole concept, the biblical truth is that, you know, uh, God wants everyone to be saved, but it's it's what the choice that you make. So, you know, how this, then why does scripture say, uh, you know, uh, why does God say, Jacob, I have loved, but he saw I have hated. You know, uh, how uh, basically scripture says God cannot hate anyone, then he can't, he ceases to be God because uh, he's not holy. Um, God is love, 1 John. Okay, we read that. Uh, so how do we interpret this is, uh, you know, even before time began, God already knew the choices that we are going to make, who's going to choose, what choice Esau is going to make, what choice Jacob is going to make. He already knows even before time began, uh, even before any one of us even came on the face of this earth, who is going to choose salvation, who is going to choose him, and who is not going to choose him. So, you know, that is what scripture teaches us. So when we look at these scriptures, then we need to interpret that in the light of the rest of scripture, knowing that God already has uh, has foreknowledge. He does not predestine, you know, who's going to do what, because it's our own choice, but he has a foreknowledge of who is going to choose what. And hence he reveals at certain points uh, you know, what the choices that they're going to make because he already knows beforehand the choices that he makes, that people are going to make. But it is God's desire that all men be saved, uh, uh, you know, and come to the knowledge of the truth. So then we can say, then why should we preach to uh, uh, to all men? But, you know, the word of God says, you know, here uh, in, uh, uh, in verse... Um, uh, you know, it says, you know, uh, they, they would come to the knowledge of the truth or, you know, other scripture passages is how, how could, uh, how could they know the truth unless anyone, uh, uh, someone preaches to them, you know, or someone shares the truth to them. So that is, uh, uh, it is important that we share the truth because the truth will set them free. Okay. John chapter 17, the truth, uh, Father, let them know the truth, then the truth will set them free. So we share the truth so that, uh, you know, people would choose. Uh, and yes, God no, has foreknowledge, but he does not plead to stand or does not say, okay, some are for eternal hell and some for eternal heaven. Does that help? Uh, yeah, yes, 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 Pastor Sabina. Uh, uh, yeah, I must. Uh, I think I need to also attend the Romans <laughs> because uh, I still have doubts in the verses 14, uh, where he 14 and 15, the rest of the chapter in Romans 9. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, he, for he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I'll have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, not of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Uh, so it, it just goes on. So I think I need to get a better understanding of the chapter and the context. Yeah, yeah. and even that verse needs to be seen in the light of, uh, you know, what God is saying that, you know, uh, why is he saying it here? Because he'll have mercy on those who, you know, those who, uh, prove themselves to be make choices that are worthy of God's mercy. God's mercy will be extended to him. God's compassion will be extended to them. But you know those who make choices, uh, you know, uh, uh, like Esau, who was just sold his birthright, who never even valued his uh, spiritual birthright, just sold it, considered it as an unworthy thing, just sold it for a, a, a bowl of soup. You know, they will they would reap the consequences of their uh, choices. So that is what you know. So it doesn't mean that you know uh, God will have mercy on some and show compassion on some. He would love some, hate the other. He cannot because that is not God's nature. Again, has to be see anything that you read in Scripture always has to be interpreted in the uh, in the light of God's nature, who God is, and what He does. So we can't just take these things literally as it's written but we need to interpret it in the light of God's nature now God's nature is you know he has so God who's gracious and compassionate slow to anger abounding in love and it does not qualify whom 
right? So that is God. That's what makes him God. That is his nature. So we interpret this here in the light and the preceding verses that he showed mercy to Jacob and not to Esau because of the choice that he made. He sh showed mercy to the Israelites and not to the Egyptians and not to Pharaoh because of the choices that they made. They hardened their hearts. Yes, yeah, so basically, if you uh, if you study Romans and go through Romans and the other scriptures, it will just help you to uh, understand. But uh, just to know that you know uh, uh, God has a foreknowledge of our choices, and uh, yes, we face the consequences of the choices that we make. But uh, uh, irrespective of that, you know, God still has chosen uh, uh, grace and His uh, favor and His mercy to all of us. Does that help? Uh, Sure, sure, Pastor. Thank you so much. Uh, because we read that, you know, the goodness of the Lord uh, leads to repentance. Okay, I think this is in First Timothy itself. The goodness of God leads to uh, a repentance, uh, right? So, uh, so God's goodness, even if for a sinner, he still shows his goodness so that it will bring them to repentance. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Okay, we'll continue. So, um, uh, any other questions from verses 1 to verse four, uh, 4? Okay, uh, verses 5 to 7. Um, here in verse 5, you know, the, this is one place in the Bible uh, where it's mentioned uh, there is one God, okay, and one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. So, the Bible is very clear that there is one God and their salvation only through Jesus Christ. He's the only one who gave himself as a ransom for all. So, you know, um, uh, you know, many of people from, um, many of the people from different faiths, uh, you know, uh, ask us this question, why do you all stick to this, uh, to this point that there is salvation only through uh, Jesus Christ? Well, you know, uh, it's because scripture tells us, the Bible tells us, the inspired word of God, you know, tells us that there is salvation only through uh, the man, Jesus Christ. He's the only one who gave himself up as a ransom for all. So what is the, the meaning of uh, this word ransom? Uh, the Greek word is anti uh which means we studied this. Um, I think in somewhere in uh, when I taught you all uh, uh, systematic theology. Uh, uh, you know, anti it just means uh, 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 re paying a redemption price. Uh, so Christ paid the price for our redemption uh, by giving his life, laying down his life. Uh, you know, um, to, so who did he pay the redemption price to? He did not pay the redemption price to Satan. Uh, that's wrong because Satan, uh, he did not offend Satan in any way. He did not do anything against Satan, but the redemption price was paid to God the Father. Uh, why? Because we were held captives once we became sinners. You know, uh, we became uh, prisoners. We became slaves of Satan, um, and you know, a rans and God required that you know a ransom price be paid, uh, so that people can be redeemed and delivered from their uh, sins, um, uh, from their captivity. So Jesus gave His life uh, for the redemption of everyone. So who did Jesus redeem us from? He redeemed us from Satan, but the redemption price was not paid to Satan, but uh, to God the Father. And so he says here that, you know, um, you know, so that we can, all of us, he paid the ransom price for everyone. So Jesus laid down his life. He paid the ransom price for every person. So all of us can live in freedom, walk in freedom, uh, because the price has been paid, uh, which means devil has no longer a hold on us, a claim on us. Um, you know, Jesus has offered uh, the ransom price to the Father. Uh, so Satan has no longer legal claims over any of us. His legal claims over us has been canceled. It has been terminated. 
and uh, you know uh, has been nullified and satan has no more claims over us because the full sufficient and the perfect sacrifice was being paid and the redemption price for our salvation for our freedom uh, uh, was paid by christ who laid down his life for uh, us so paul is saying you know we are here now you know to pray this into effect uh, not just pray this into effect, but also to preach, to announce, to teach this good news so that people will come to know this truth and embrace Jesus Christ, receive salvation, and be uh, saved. So Elisha says, knowledge of the truth, is it head knowledge of Jesus or an experiencing knowledge of Jesus? It is this truth that, you know, who we are, where, what is our position, where we lie, um you know that we could not buy ourselves out of the slave market because the price is too high we cannot purchase ourselves out and so god became man and uh the truth is that jesus came uh who was the perfect uh human being and who made the perfect sacrifice uh, for our sins and paid the redemption price that was required by God the Father and purchased us out of slavery, out of um, the legal claim of that Satan had on, on us human beings and has terminated that and, uh, you know, uh, has nullified it. And uh, this is the truth that uh, we need to preach and teach. So it's just not uh, head knowledge. It's the truth of the gospel, it's the truth of salvation, the core truth of salvation and gospel. And it's something that a person will, you know, experience one, once they have, um, you know, accepted, you know, uh, they have fulfilled, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, you know the condition that is required they fulfill that condition of receiving of accepting it and they begin to live that life of freedom out of slavery because they can experience that uh, in its fullness once they have accepted jesus christ as their lord and savior does that help elisha yes madam yes, thank you very much okay so uh, paul is saying you know pray this into effect pray preach teach uh, so that people will come to know this truth, um, embrace Jesus, and be uh, saved. And then Paul says, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So Paul was a preacher, he was an apostle, he was a teacher. Uh, we also know that he walked as a prophet. Uh, much of the prophetic New Testament scriptures was written by Apostle Paul. Uh, he also uh, served as a pastor. You know, uh, uh, he uh, uh, you know churches that he planted. Uh, he uh, you know played the role of a pastor. He oversaw churches, gave spiritual insight. Um, uh, so you know this shows us that a person can uh, you know flow in more than one uh, ministry office gift uh, just as the lord jesus determined so you know the gifts of the spirit the gifts of the spirit the nine gifts is given to everyone uh, but the ministry office gifts is uh, you know um, which we read uh, in ephesians uh, is you know something that uh, the lord jesus christ uh, you know uh, determines for each one. So here we see that a person can flow in the office of a prophet, an apostle, a preacher, uh, and a uh, and a teacher. Okay. So and also we know that uh, you know Paul's uh, ministry was primarily to the Gentiles, um, and uh, God can call us. Uh, the, uh, likewise, God can call us to a specific uh, geographical locations, communities, uh, race. Uh, tribes of people or to specific people or to smaller or larger communities where we can minister okay so uh, Paul was um, a preacher apostle teacher a pastor and also prophet and much of the Old Testament prophetic uh, New Testament scriptures was uh, written by Apostle Paul any questions on verses 5 to 7 
Okay, uh, we'll move on then. If there's no questions, verses 8 to 10. I desire, therefore, that... Uh, okay, can somebody read verses 8 to 10, please? Anyone? Yes, Avani, you can go ahead. I desire, then, that in every place the men should pray, <clears throat> lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling, Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Amen. Thanks, Stephanie. So in the light of all that has been said, Paul gets back uh, to the main point. He says that men everywhere should pray and here the Greek word for men is not like what he mentioned in uh, verse 1 uh, there the Greek word was anthropos which means uh, you know uh, all people it just means uh, in, uh, men women and children people but here you know the Greek word is anod which means male specifically talking about the male gender specifically uh, instructing men so he says you know men everywhere should pray uh, you know and how should they pray they 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 pray by lifting up hands uh, which means you know when you lift up hands you're basically saying I surrender you know I give up so sur in surrender to God uh, holy hands lifting up holy hands means uh, uh, praying in holiness, in reverence, um, uh, and he says, you know, pray without wrath or doubting, uh, which means pray without arguing or doubting, without anger, without quarreling, there should be no strife among you, pray in such a way. So men, uh, the call is out for you all, you know, get men uh, together and pray, and when you pray, you know, pray with surrendered wills and lives, uh, pray in holiness, uh, pray without anger, quarreling, and there should be no strife among you. And uh, it's not just uh, for men that he says that, uh, you know, Paul uh, says they should pray, but he says in like manner, that means similarly, women also should join in prayer. So women, uh, we have no excuse. We do have to pray just like men, you know, uh, in, in lifting up holy hands, in surrender, you know, in holiness, uh, without quarreling, strife, anger. There should be no quarreling, strife, or anger uh, amongst us, within us. And then he also says that women need to dress modestly and engage in good works so that they can demonstrate uh, uh, godliness. Okay, so uh, he says, you know, uh, two important things here is, you know, the importance is good works and uh, godliness. So you should pray uh, focusing on uh, godliness and good works. And he says that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Uh, you know, he says, this is how women are supposed to dress or believers or Christian women are supposed to dress, especially when they come to Christian meetings, Paul is saying how they need to dress. They, and he uses the words uh, propriety and moderation, uh, which helps us to explain what he means by modest apparel. So what is propriety? It means uh, what is appropriate for the occasion. You know, just answer these questions. Are you overdressed or are you underdressed? Okay. Uh, if you are, if you want to be dressed properly for the occasion, you need to ask yourself, am I overdressed for this occasion or am I underdressed for this occasion? So it's, it, it is going to, you know, uh, uh, and also ask this question to yourself, you know, the way that I'm dressed, is it going to call, you know, un inappropriate attention to myself uh, is it provocative that means you know uh, is my dressing going to provocate men going to disturb them from focusing on worshiping god uh, you know uh, uh, you know we need to be sensitive to uh, uh, to men uh, to the, the challenges the temptations they face and so on our part as women we need to dress uh, appropriately 
uh, dress uh, for properly for the uh, for the occasion. We are not overdressed, not underdressed. Uh, our dressing is uh, not provocative, not provocating men, and also um, does not call for inappropriate attention to our, to ourselves. Not just drawing all the attention of people around us to ourselves. So that is the meaning of propriety, and then moderation. You know, uh, you know. I'm just asking the question: Is it moderate? Uh, is it just too much or far too little? You know, uh, basically, moderation looks for more uh, for middle ground. So we're not just overdressed, or we're not dressed too little, just wearing the right appropriate clothes uh, for the occasion. Basically, when we are going for Christian meetings, here he's talking about when you go to church. Uh, and why is he talking about this is, you know, he's talking to the church at Ephesus where people are coming from pagan cultures, pagan backgrounds into the church and accepting Christ. And we need to know that, uh, like I said in the introduction, uh, Ephesus, the city was famous for this temple of uh, uh, Diana. Uh, so I'll just talk about that in a little bit, you know, but here Paul says uh, the braided hair or, or you know, he says, um, uh, uh, in like manner, women themselves uh, should dress in, in modest apparel with propriety, moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly, uh, uh, costly clothing. I'll just close with this. We just run out of time. Sorry, I didn't look at the time. So Paul here mentions uh, all of these things. Uh, you know, he's saying that if it is. Uh, you know, not against the principles of propriety and moderation in that culture. You now, don't wear it. You know, so as Paul is mentioning all of these because they went against the principles of uh, propriety and moderation in that culture. Women were overdoing things, overdressing. It was not appropriate for their culture in the context of the church, and so he's addressing uh, that. But then he's saying, you know, uh, women should focus on godliness and and good works and not on other things so we look at why paul mentions this why he writes about this in the next class we'll try to interpret it in the rest of other scripture and try to understand what he's basically saying here okay Th sorry uh just way past two minutes of our class time anyone has any questions before we end class any questions Okay, if there's no questions, then uh, we'll end class. But, you know, when we began class, Asha had a question here. She says, where do we all submit the independent research? So if somebody can help her, it'll be great. Okay, thank you all for joining class. Uh, have a blessed uh, day and a week ahead. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.